Hi there, I'm a film student and I'm going to give you my take on We'll be diving into five categories and scoring each of them out of ten. Total them up and that's the film's overall score. I'll also be talking about the clues and hints given throughout the film and prove that you are smarter than you think. Now, let's get into the story. I'll do a shorter synopsis before diving into the clues. So, the story begins as US Marshal Teddy Daniels and his new partner Chuck travel to Shutter Island, a remote psychiatric facility for the criminally insane to investigate the disappearance of a patient named Rachel Solando. When they arrive, they're met with an unwelcoming atmosphere and meet Dr. Corley, the head psychiatrist, who just acts super sketchy. As Teddy delves deeper into the investigation, he uncovers disturbing clues that suggest something sinister is afoot on the island. He becomes haunted by his past, particularly during World War II and the death of his wife in a fire set by a patient on the island named Andrew Ladis. Teddy's search for Rachel slowly turns into a search for Ladis himself, letting the personal agenda take over. He begins to question the motives of the staff and becomes increasingly paranoid and distrustful. Teddy starts seeing allusions of his past, like his wife dying in a fire, his dead children dripping with water and flashbacks to his time in World War II. Turns out he killed his wife after she killed their three children. Teddy's mind created the fire and the idea of a Teddy Daniels and everyone around him was in on it, even Chuck. This was all an experiment by the facility to see if he faces reality, as if not, they would have to lobotomize him. We realize he actually does face reality, but wants the lobotomy anyway, saying, Which would be worse? To live as a monster? Or to die as a good man? Now, what if I told you all along that there were signs about what was real and what was just an illusion? Well, to start, in every flashback of his wife, we see what he wants to believe. You know, with her in the fire. But if you look closer, you can see her drenched with water coming from her stomach. This is just one example of how fire and water highlight what's real and what's Teddy's delusion. Whenever you see fire or smoke, it usually means Teddy's hallucinating. Like when he meets Rachel Solando, she is an illusion due to him being off his meds and suffering from withdrawal. And when Teddy blows up Corley's car to cause a distraction, we also see his wife and child engulfed in flames. Let me know if you managed to clock onto any of this in the comments. Water, on the other hand, shows Teddy the truth and shows us how close he's getting to the truth. The storm keeps him stranded on the island for one. A better example would be when he's in his dreams. Water's dripping from pretty much everywhere, even if the house is on fire. In summary, Shutter Island is gripping as hell and keeps you on the edge of your seat with its twists and turns that really catch you off guard. The film explores themes of guilt, identity, and the nature of reality, leaving audiences questioning everything they thought they knew. I'd happily rate it a strong 9 out of 10, but I'm not sure whether I should rate it a full 10, so you, you let me know in the comments. I want to mainly talk about DiCaprio Kingsley and how characters react to Teddy's illusions. So to start off, I feel Leonardo DiCaprio was a key part in keeping the audiences guessing as to what's real and what's fake. He needed to seem so sure that his illusions were reality to the point where we believe him blindly. And I feel for most viewers, it worked really well. I imagine if you've seen the film, you didn't get the twist until toward the end because DiCaprio's acting made the imaginary character, Teddy Daniels, so believable. Also, the scene where he finds his children is just bone chilling. He did so well for that part in particular. In an interview, he talked about how in-depth the character was and how he had a ton of twists and turns just trying to understand him. He said, Like with any character, you want it to be um, complex. And this was one of the most complex characters I've ever gotten to play, if not the most complex character I've ever had to play. And before I talk about Kingsley, I just want to say I didn't really find Ruffalo's performance outstanding in any way. It just fell a little flat, so that's why I guess I'm not talking about him too much. Anyway, I felt Kingsley was so brilliant in the fact that his performance is so subtle on your first watch, but then when you watch it again and look closer, you see what's actually happening. Take the first time he meets Teddy. He subtly brings up water torture and drowning to try and see his reaction. Take a look at this. We submerge them in icy water until they lost consciousness or even drowned. And now? We treat them. Try to heal, try to cure. And notice how at the end of the film, he's still trying to convince Teddy that he's really Andrew without trying to startle him until he needs to defend Chuck. So he shoves pictures of his family in his face. Lastly, in the scene where he's trying to reveal to Teddy that he doesn't have a partner, not only do we get another example of Corley seeming evil on first watch, but wanting to help the second time around, but we also get a more in-your-face example of how the background characters behave. Now I know this is directing rather than acting, but I love how just by watching the background cast, you'll be able to see all the hints and clues that show they all already know that he's a patient here and the entire facility is in on the role play. We also get a more direct reveal in this scene too. Who did this to you, George? You did. What the hell do you mean? It can be quite upsetting. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, 
The patient got so wound up by one of Noyce's stories that he beat him up. So while Leo's Teddy Daniels and Kingsley's Corley were brilliant and well-acted characters, I feel the supporting roles were nothing super special. If we're looking at why the supporting character seems so important, it can be whittled down to the directors in my opinion. So for that, the performance gets a 6 out of 10 from me. Your match is about to go out. Okay, cinematographer Robert Richardson's lighting plays a crucial role in setting the mood and emphasising the little clues. He uses light and shadows to show what's real and what's fake. He'll often use high contrast lighting during scenes with a sense of dread, while softer diffuse light is used in flashbacks. If you think you know how high contrast lighting works, then even you may learn something from my review on the first Harry Potter film, which I'll leave a card for here and a link at the end. Richardson also uses depth of field to the best of its abilities. He's constantly using shallow depth to blur the background and having the actor's face looking crisp. This gives us a close-up view of how they're showing what their character's feeling. He also uses a bunch of slow pushes and slow turns to build suspense because they're usually used when revealing something and, and this plays with our expectations a ton and subconsciously builds adrenaline. I feel there's a little more I could talk about but I've definitely got my point across already. I mean it's an amazing example of how good cinematography can be because not only does it incorporate a wide range of shots, he knows how and when to use them and it shows the audience how amazing cinematography can be. Overall, I'm giving this segment an eight out of 10. Marshall Daniels. The film opens up with a chilling, deep cello that tells us immediately that this is going to be a thriller. It also uses this tune throughout the film to keep that constant reminder there. Although it's not the only kind of music we see. When Teddy's thinking of a dying German officer from the war, we hear classical music. We also sometimes hear it when he's thinking about his wife. And this change in music tone shows that Teddy's life before his family's death was a different time for him. When Teddy first reaches the island, we see a shot of the facility, and with it we hear chains and other metallic sounds which subconsciously tells us this isn't a place of free will. Which is shown, of course, in the fact that Teddy isn't actually who he thinks he is at all. The way sound is paired with whatever's going on on screen is really well done, actually. And to help appreciate it more, I'm going to do something I don't usually do and just throw a couple facts at you. So synchronised sound in film started in 1927 when Warner Bros brought out The Jazz Singer. You ain't heard nothing yet. And this is super interesting, but Shutter Island has a ton of Foley, which gets its name from Jack Foley, the man who invented it. Foley is a different form of sound effects because it's all recorded live rather than being recordings taken from other places. I'll link a video of someone doing Foley work that you should definitely watch. Why am I telling you this? Well, the amount of Foley we see in this film that matches up with what's going on on screen is insane. Like the chains I mentioned before, it almost makes up for the lack of differentiation in score. Anyway, I've talked enough about the sound here. While it is interesting and does help emphasise some of the hidden meanings, the score just doesn't do it for me, and on top of that, it doesn't have any original soundtrack. So yeah, it's a 4 out of 10 from me. Teddy? So the editing uses a pretty clever trick to keep us in the dark, but still on the edge of our seats. The transitions between visions and reality and past and present are basically seamless, but once he's in a flashback, the editing subtly shifts to be more snappy and quick. The reason this works so well is not only does it feel like the flashbacks are more heavy hitting, but it also makes the present feel more suspenseful. The VFX in this film are interesting, with the majority of wide shots and down and being paintings, um, with CGI added in later. Also, the lighthouse is a miniature, which is cool. Another example is the fire and ash in this scene it isn't too great, though. I mean, having fire and ash without even the tiniest bit of smoke does take me out of it a bit. Um, and the transition between Dolores being there and then gone just isn't too clean, honestly. That being said, while the editing at its core helped build a sense of tension throughout the film, the VFX just wasn't there. So for that, it just gets a 4 out of 10 for me. Before we unveil the total score, I want to say please comment below what aspects you enjoyed and what you didn't find as entertaining. And let me know, what did I miss? To conclude, the final score for Shutter Island is... 31! <laughs> I hope you have a wonderful and productive rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.